Welcome to a special edition of Strategy Talk. Today, we will begin to explore the wargaming and publishing exploits of Jim Dunnigan. We plan on taking several episodes to cover in depth Jim's impact on commercial and military gaming. Editor's note. Later in the episode, I miscall the game Firefight City Fight, a game which was to be published later. Welcome, Austin and Jim. We're going to take a departure from what we normally do here on Strategy Talk and uh, talk about... Jim's career in wargaming history and also his publishing career. So we're going to, every other episode, do this for a while until we run out of material. But today what we're going to do is go back to the 60s and talk to Jim about what uh, his efforts were there. And um, Jim, when, when were you ex- first exposed to wargaming? Well, that was interesting because I I was down at Redstone Arsenal. I joined the Army, and I took the test, and they said, oh, you're one of them smart-ass guys, so I'll send you to the rocket, you know, rocket repairman school. And uh, that was an interesting experience in and of itself. Um, but one thing I discovered down there was in the they had these recreation centers. The, the school basically ran 24-7. Uh, they were short on facilities, but they were long on demand. They, there were a lot of new missile systems coming out and a big need to train people. And uh, so anyway, the, the, the rec center was open 20, 24 hours a day, which was unusual in the Army in those days. And um, what they uh, had there was a collection of games. I never found out exactly how they got them, but there were a bunch of Avalon Hill games. This was, mm, I guess, 62 um, and, uh, I said, Hey, this is interesting. And, uh, guys in my class, um, who later became the, uh, the ordnance detachment for the 81st, uh, was it 381st, uh, missile battalion. Um, we were already, you know, in touch with each other as we were before we even got shipped out. And a bunch of us got interested in the war games. And I forget what they were. They Probably D-Day was one of them. Uh, whatever was uh, at Courant in uh, 1962. And I thought to myself, this is interesting. And um, so I started reading up on it. My parents sent me a book, which is which I, for the life of me, I couldn't find a find name. It was in the – Al might have it uh, when we get him on. Uh, but it was about the, uh, the French army before Napoleon – before the revolution, uh, the camps, as they called them, they held these training camps uh, once a year. Uh, these are special camps. Now, this is interesting in terms of war game history and things most people don't know about, you know, Napoleonic warfare. I was, it, was, it was a surprise to me. And apparently, it was a surprise to the historical community because this guy got great reviews. Anyway, uh, what they did was they basically developed a lot of the tactics that Napoleon later got credit for. Now, the Prussians were doing the same thing. Al has a lot to say about that, you know, about all the way through the 19th century to um, uh, to the various Prussian generals who, you know, used the, uh, these techniques to, uh, to prove or disprove historical events. And um, the, uh, I just said, hmm, maybe, maybe, maybe I could design war games. Now, just, so what were the, the, the Napoleonics? Were they the, the camps? Well, all, all of Napoleon's tactics. And he, he laid them out. I mean, basically these, these pre-revolutionary generals. Now, now it isn't difficult to see how it, how it went over to the revolutionary, to the Napoleonic army, because many of his officers were not just and former NCOs. A lot is made of that, but a lot of his marshals and generals had, been uh, uh, officers for the Royalist Army, and they basically joined the revolutionaries. The Russians had the same experience. I think uh, in the 30s, before the uh, before the the crackdown by Stalin, uh, something like oh half of the uh, of the uh, Russian senior officers were former Tsarist officers. That's one reason why he killed most of them. That was one of his big mistakes. But that's another story. Napoleon did not kill them, <laughs> and. Um, these guys proceeded to win a lot of the victories basically by using the, takes the techniques that they had developed before the revolution. Uh, Napoleon was smart enough to see. I don't think he ever actually took credit for a lot of these things because he was more of a strategist. 
strategist than a uh, than a tactician. In fact, he became infamous for that. He left strategist, you know, tactics to the people who were better at it and concentrated on strategy and uh, and logistics and things like that. And he does in uh, he does deserve credit for what he did there. Uh, indeed, he was in effect wargaming, and I've described this in some of the books I've written on wargaming. Uh, he in effect wargamed out most of his campaigns. You know, people crawling over maps. Pushing, putting pins in, making marks and what have you, doing calculations. Sounds like a war game to me. And actually it was, but before it's time. Uh, anyway. And uh, tactically, were they doing the same thing in the, the, the camps? Were they war gaming it out? or? Well, the camps were mostly tactical. Uh-huh. The camps were basically lining up the troops and saying, well, what if we march them this way? What if we do this with them? They okay. were basically influenced by Frederick the Great who invented things like the oblique order. I mean, Frederick did some amazing things, and that's how he won half his battles, the, 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 the half that counted. He fought 16 battles, and he won eight of them, and he kept Prussia in the game, as it were. And he was basically you know, looked upon as the, as the grand general, as it were, of the 18th century. Anyway, the uh, uh, the French were influenced by this because they were often on the receiving end of these uh, these Prussian you know victories, and um, uh, they realized that uh, you know there's something to be said for this, and they basically tried to improve on Frederick. Um, the uh, Prussian army, in the meantime, didn't try to improve on Frederick, and they got creamed by Napoleon. Because now there goes to show you, you know, uh, technology is static, including tactics. Uh, Napoleon encouraged his generals uh, and officers and generals to uh, basically improve on whatever that they already had, because you know, change he recognized was a weapon in and of itself, and he was correct. Uh, the Prussians made the big mistake of trying to, uh, how should I put it, scrupulously imitate Frederick, uh, but they they were basically were going through the motions and they didn't have the spark that Frederick had. The um, so you know all of those guys were interested. Now we were the you know we we were a fairly smart bunch. We were among those people which I later came to call the over. Uh, I called war games the hobby for the overeducated. I think actually I think it was Howie Barash who literally coined the term. But we recognized when we started the, uh, the war gaming publishing company SPI. I realized that. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a large market for this. Avalon Hill was selling a lot of the, their war games through the, the retail channel, um, and uh, they thought there was a huge market, and I thought there wasn't, and I turned out to be correct. <laughs> they were basically uh, selling a lot of what I came to call closet games, and I actually convinced Tom Shaw of this eventually, And uh, which games basically were bought. This looks interesting. I, I can't understand it when it's in the closet. Maybe somebody might drag it out later, but in most cases, they didn't build a large community of war gamers, despite the large numbers they were selling. Right. Large in the sense that, you know, this commercial board games, as it were. Right. So, and I, I, I went in and looked at their, you know, publishing up until you became involved with them. And it was a mixture. So they, they had the war games, but then they had what the recreational games on sports, you know, uh, sailing, uh, right. Uh, trains, that sort of thing. And so they really were only publishing about one war game a year. Which was one, one of one your beefs two, with them, two, right? Uh, it was it was expensive not to not to design a war game. I later spoke to I I got became buddies with Larry Pinsky. He designed the Bulge game, I think, and, and he got involved in a couple of others. And he he basically uh, he went on to become a physicist. And uh, last time I checked with him, he was working on gravity or you know the understanding of gravity. In fact, he, he got quoted once in a front page New York Times article, which was a big deal in in his field. Anyway, Larry explained it. They just brought in a bunch of bright, you know, overeducated, so to speak, war gamers, local uh, high school in his case, uh, kids, and they cut them loose. And Tom Shaw was smart in that respect. He said, these kids seem to have it together. Let them just let them go. And they went and off they off the company went. So uh, Charlie Roberts, who came up with the idea of commercial war games first, uh, you know, caught on to the fact that, you know, it wasn't that huge a market. He couldn't sell a lot of titles. Um, and he tried. And that's how he went basically got into, uh, you know, uh, financial problems and had to sell out to his, his printer, which was the, uh, the, the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, dot family. Avalon, Avalon, yeah, dot the, the Avalon printing company. Right. Monarch. Uh, yeah. 
Monarch printing company. And so anyway, at this point, we didn't know all that. We just saw these games, and they were interesting. We were in the Army. Most of us had no, no permanent interest in, in, military, in the military. But we were all history buffs, and I noticed that early on. You know, most of us had read history books. You know, it's just we were buffs. And then we came across these games. All of us were had a, you know, we're not, didn't get math headaches. Uh, we were studying very technical subjects, electronics, hydraulics, you name it. We were into it. I, I was even in charge of part of the nuclear weapon system. Uh, and uh, the, uh, what developed out of that was I kept at it. And basically, a lot of some of the guys that I I, I, I gamed with, as it were, down at uh, the Redstone Arsenal, uh, ended up with me in the uh, in the in the. They organized two uh, sergeant missile battalions. The reason I knew these guys, they were classes for sergeant missile technicians. So obviously, a lot of us were going to end up overseas together. And um, when they finally chose who was going to go to uh, to Germany, the first battalion going over and who's going to go to Korea the second battalion I found out that it was done alphabetically <laughs> so it's done again Berg you know all these guys whose names again went were from A to whatever the cutoff was you know uh, they chose us first you guys are going to Korea the rest of you guys are going to Germany so we lost out on that um, so the uh, so we were all familiar with each other and with war games. And when we got to Korea, we found out a number of our officers were into war games. Now they couldn't war game with with uh, enlisted men, but you know information was passed back and forth. The battalion commander found out about that. I was one of his. He had three or four guys, enlisted guys, who were his his troubleshooters. Uh, he recognized he had a bright bunch of kids on his hands and he found a couple of guys who could basically when there was a problem uh you know administrative problem that needed somebody who was quick on the uptake and and could understand things and could fix it i was one of his guys so that that paid off and i got to chat with him a couple of times and i missed them by two years at the army war college and starting in the 70s they invited me down there to talk to the uh the lieutenant colonels who were on the fast track for higher rank they went through the Army War College course, which I think was one year or two years, whatever. And um, I gave them a talk, uh, one one basic classroom session, where I explained how you can basically war game out your activities. Um, and, uh, and Austin caught some of this, you know, uh, not knowing it, because uh, I basically on the, on the on the you know I I outlined on the on the on the blackboard, et cetera, et cetera. The, the simple, you know, the basics of, of war game design and where you could get them and what have you. At that point, SPI was going great guns, so there was plenty of stuff that we were doing. And, um, but the most important bit of information I imparted to them, I says, look, any unit you have, you're going to have a lot of war games. Now, I mean, not a huge number, but you're going to have a couple of dozen. If you're, you, your guys are going to be running brigades, so you, you probably got at least a dozen experienced, smart war gamers. If you want to apply this, I'm not saying you should do it yourself, but it's just put out the word, any, any GI or officer for that matter, who is, is a very familiar, an experienced war gamer, report to so-and-so, you know, we have a, a special operation. And that actually worked in more cases than one. In fact, I got one letter from a, from a guy who had been at the, at the uh, war college. And by the way, I, I missed Colonel Jessup by two years. That would have been a great conversation because he was a very smart guy, which is, of course, was why he went to the Army War College. They had, they had, they had class photographs. That's how I found him. I just went through. He said, you know, he should have gone through early 70s. Probably, and bingo, there he was two years before I showed up. And um, he uh, uh, he basically uh, would have done that, you know, if he had to war game something out. He was the kind of battalion commander who, you know, who was, was hip to that sort of thing. And most of the guys going through the War College uh, class uh, were of the same stripe. And I got a letter from one guy in the late 60s who already had a brigade command. And he just thanked me. He says, you know, I actually use this and it worked great. He, he was talking about field exercises. They had these big field exercises once or twice a year. And they were given, you know, the uh, the outline of their mission, which meant moving, you know, units, you know, over uh, making several movements, tactical movements and doing this and that. And he and I, one of the things I mentioned was field exercises. I says you can basically get guys who can analyze a map and. Uh, 
we had already discussed in, in, in strategy and tactics of the magazine about how you do this and what have you. So a lot of war gamers are familiar with this. And, and indeed, indeed, we did a book, oh, I guess in the late seventies, the war game design, which put it all in one place. Uh, and uh, in 1980, I did the War Games Handbook, which expanded it on it and so on and so forth. The, um, uh, but he had done it, and he said he, he aced it. I mean, basically, it gave him a huge edge. Other guys were making mistakes, miscalculations on how long it would take him to get here, get there. But his, his little band of half a dozen war gamers uh, did a terrain analysis uh basically made up you know a different movement factors as it were for different types of terrain it says well if we're going to march from here to here all right this is a this is a bad road this is a good road all right we have to make a cross country uh, detour over here that's going to take us x amount of time and what have you and the court the court leadership was amazed you know he says colonel how the hell did you uh how the hell did you you up i move so fast and again the word spread and that eventually reached austin bay when he showed up i don't know when when were you in in uh, in uh, in in uh, in germany all right listen i, I i've got to make a, a upfront statement uh, here dan J- jim's heard this before uh, jim you uh, you you got to understand he is the guru of modern uh board war gaming actually modern war gaming and uh, I'm not the only one who has said that. Many have, but including Andy Marshall, former head of the Office of Net Assessments, which and, and Mr. Marshall led it for what, Jim, about 40 years or so. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, was, he was he was he was Mr. Reality Check. Yeah. Oh, all right, all right. But the, 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 the thing is, war games help you think. You know, one of Jim's strengths too is that he spent his career telling everybody we're really not in uh, to. Uh, prediction we're into uh, uh, we're predicting the past and that may give us some insight in the future it's one of the reasons that I like to use the word projection because you're projecting off of games but to, to get back to it Jim's interest that, that was uh, sparked when he was exposed to them they revealed a genius and I will say say that not just from having worked it uh, with him take a look at the influence he's had and uh the uh, broad uh, uh broad success not just in the commercial field but in the uh in defense circles uh as well now what jim's referring to is one of the biggest coincidences that could possibly uh possibly occur you know coincidences are puns of the universe i'm uh, a first lieutenant and the operations section of First Infantry Division Forward. It was a set up as the lead element of First Infantry Division. The rest of it was back at Fort Riley, but we were and, like a, and you were so, armor, right? Well, uh, uh, at, at at this time, I had done my uh, armor. Uh, uh, yeah, I I went to Armor Officers Basic, and I was uh, Armor Officer uh, detailed, and I'd served with the 11th Cav. I was serving then in an ordnance uh as ordnance uh chemical and force development uh uh, uh slot at 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 uh, uh at, at first infantry infantry division but my background was in uh, armor mech uh, 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 and mech operations and this was a mechanized brigade group is what uh first infantry division uh forward was but here, here's here's the, the the coincidence. I would play war games, and they were almost all SBI games, with uh, one of the uh, captains who was the uh, uh, in operations, who was really the fire direction control uh, guru for uh, the uh, for, for the headqu- uh, head headquarters, and the uh, G three training officer. Who was uh, you know, he was a uh, he was a major, at uh, uh, very various SPI games. The big one, of course, is that the uh, <clears throat> artillery officer and I set up and actually played war in the east in the basement of this this building that was there on the base. We tried to play it, okay, it was so big, but with uh, you you'd have to do it on lucky Saturday afternoons when we weren't uh, uh, weren't busy. But the div- division operations officer, Colonel Hanson, who happened to be a Texas Aggie, uh, I went to Rice. He loved teasing me about uh, 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 going to Rice. He was he knew that we were interested in war games. 
We also had a senior plans officer, uh, I believe, well, later Colonel Jones at the time, Major Captain Major, uh, Major Jones, who had used wargaming techniques to plan uh, what Reforger 76. And he, he had me and the division training officer, who was also a wargamer, working with him on planning what we were going to do during Reforger 76. This is really an important detail getting to Dunnigan, all right? Uh, <clears throat> Reforger 76, we were to be the Russians, and we were going to have a Panzer Grenadier Brigade as well as 4th Canadian Mechanized Brigade Group with us and a few other, a few other mech units from Europe, plus 1st Ranger Battalion, and the top secret thing at the time was we had 250 French special forces assigned to us, the Dragoon Militaire, who were going to uh, operate the, the French and, and First Ranger B Battalion were going to be our Spetsnaz for this uh, uh, for this attack. So we <clears throat> went through, we used uh, regular uh, attack maps but used wargaming techniques that you can see that were utilized by uh, SPI. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, all three of us, uh, Major Jones, um, Major Sun, and First Lieutenant Bay, uh, I, Pete may have been a captain at the time, Ken, but, but they uh, <clears throat> set out and we'd, we'd all, we're all familiar with SPI games. Now, we weren't planning the, the Germans and the Canadians would have their own tactical decisions uh, and operational decisions, but we were looking at how we, since we're supposed to be the Russians, we're going to use uh, a Russian type assault on uh, the rest of combination of 7th Corps and 5th Corps that were going to be uh, uh, playing uh, uh, NATO. Also, there were Bundeswehr uh, 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 playing NATO. I understand we were outnumbered, but we were supposed to be, you know, represent a, a, a force twice the size of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the, of the NATO forces. Uh, and when I say that in, in a, in a, in a game, you can, in a field exercise, there are ways to go ahead and, and, and do that. And you can have your, your platoons represent companies uh, and the like. Uh, but that's, that's, that's getting tangential to this. So we used all these techniques to set it up. And ultimately, uh, <clears throat> Major Jones wrote the uh, 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 sent the plan up uh, up to, uh, uh, to to division. We had you know, the Canadians and Germans come, and uh, we t talked about it. it. Was his recommended plan, of course, because all the generals and ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately, <clears throat> U.S. Army Europe commander would uh, uh, approve our plan without telling his, his uh, uh, other subordinates, or at least look at what we were, uh, were going to do. Uh, uh, we're going to do now, as we <clears throat> move past the reforger exercise, a request comes down from usurer through seventh Corps to test a game called firefight. <laughs> and oh, this is yeah. fire. And we received two copies of it. It, it was had green and black and white. It was camouflage on it. It was an uh, army army version. And I looked at it. It was an SPI game. And there's Dunnigan's name on. You know what, what it was because because I got and called in. Now there were two versions of firefight. There was well, one done for the this, army, this, right? This is the Ur version, okay, okay? But the thing actually, the Ur version is what Jim. Uh, I mean, the original is what Jim and SPI. Uh, but, uh, uh, dead, but this was one that was to be play tested, and they sent it to Europe, <coughs> U.S. Army Europe, Seventh Corps, and Seventh Corps decided to send it First Infantry Division forward. And of course, it goes into the op section. And Colonel Hansen comes and says, calls me in and he says, "Hey, Lieutenant Bay, I want you to play. <laughs> I want you to play this game. You go around and you play it with, with, with Captain Sun and whoever else is <laughs> is around, and then I want you to write up a report." For me. I, I had a bit of a reputation already as a as a writer. I published in a few magazines. I had a couple of articles in Army Magazine. Uh, I had written a couple of things that got 
uh, uh, picked up in in, in other uh, military uh, military publications. So when Colonel Hansen would do this, it, it was like he, you know, Austin. Not only do I want you to uh, a- analyze it when you write it up, write it up sharp. Okay, so <clears throat> there's this that other other component. So I sat around, got the rules out. Here it was. It was this terrain area that was supposed to represent something like uh, the east-west German border. And here I'd spent a year in the 11th Cav on the border. Uh, It was close enough, suggestive, you know, for game purposes. This is a first lieutenant base, first take on it. I remember laying it out there on my desk uh, and headquarters, so looking at the uh, at the pieces and, and the rules. And so I brought in uh, two or three other, uh, a couple of other officers, uh, NCO. I knew there were the NCO, the, the sergeant first class, who uh, was the uh, anti-tank platoon sergeant for the first of the 26th infantry, which was on the same post we were at in, in, uh, Gerfig in, uh, Germany. So I, I called him, got a hold of him on the phone. I said, uh, Hey, you want in on this? See Jim NCOs could play with officers. We'd play, play these games all the time, you know? And he says, Oh, sure, sir. I'd like to look at it. You okay, know? But, but you were a post Vietnam when things were, had become yeah, a little bit more relaxed, right? 76 yeah. is when we're doing this. All right. Uh, late, late 76. But, and so we, uh, let's see, I played it with three other, three other people took notes. A couple of them played it. Uh, and, uh, I think one other, I, th- I think, uh, a spec five on the, in the ops section came in and ran through He wanted to see the rules and see what it was like. Um, uh, and, uh, again, very, very, very bright guy, uh, who, uh, came in and wanted, wanted to see, uh, see how it worked. One of the most telling things was the feedback from the AT, uh, platoon sergeant, and he, we're playing this, and he says, hey, LT, you know what's wrong with this game? I said, what's that? And he says, the weapons shoot too far. Direct quote. So we sat around. I said, okay, what's, what's that mean? He says, well, look, you don't get shots like this. You know that. And I said, well, that's because of the terrain. The terrain is it's too open. And I put that down. I wrote the thing up. I ended up giving the, um, the G three and I think the G two as well was, uh, there, a, a, a brief about this. I said, uh, the way I see this, sir, is that, uh, some of this, they want to show how far, and I said, I got this some from the, from the, uh, I am trying to remember that Sergeant's name. I, I, I can come close. I won't, don't take the risk now, but was it says, you know, he said they shoot too far. And then I got to talking with a couple of the other guys and everybody says, yeah, you don't get shots like that. Cause, um, major son had been in a, a tank outfit himself. He's an armor officer. Uh, you're, you're looking at if you're, especially if you're in tighter terrain, such as in the mining gap before it, it uh, going down, Bundesstrasse 19, uh, Highway 19, coming out of the Meiningen Gap and, and going towards Schweinfurt, you don't get any long shots until the, uh, the, the bad guys have already uh, 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 <laughs> penetrated halfway to uh, halfway to Schweinfurt for the terrain opens. There are some places up uh, in 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 the Fulda Gap so, proper where you get some shots. All right, but here, so I take this this all went back uh, up to Jim. This all here's here's the point that was synthesized out of it. This game's just the military's just they're trying to show off the range of what the toes do and some of our our, our our cannons. This isn't as realistic as it could be. So I wrote that up. I. A few months later, I want to say it was three months later, not long before I rotated back to the, uh, to the States, uh, G three says, Hey, that report went all the way to the Pentagon. Uh, really, it really was, uh, 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 uh really was well received. I, I said, sir, there's a lot to be used, uh, 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 done, uh, out, of, out of that game, especially when, and by the way, Jim, 
I don't know if I ever told you this. Maybe I did. We did one that was blind where I acted as a judge so that you, you, you know, you didn't have full board view. We essentially yeah. set it up be, and, uh, we had to do a little, we only had, you know, two sets, but I, I, they had their own sets and I, I observed it, you know, uh, we, we did it. And uh, <clears throat> so we did one of the, we did, uh, did do one of those. And I was the, you know, the, the, the white team, as they uh, call it, red and blue. And I was white, uh, the, uh, uh, the judge. So it, it, it I never saw the, uh, of, official you know, response, but I got it from, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the G three full Colonel Mac, Mac infantry, Mac infantry guy. And he was, he was pleased. Uh, uh he, he was pleased with, it. uh, what happened? Well, I never heard anything back until when was it? I first met Jim in 79 after I'd gotten out of the army and was had enrolled at, uh, in grad school, uh, at, 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 at Columbia and my wife had a job, a uh, little law firm there in, in, uh, in uh, New York, two kids from Texas, you know, at, at, up in the big city. And I ended up telling him this story about it. He says, Jim, I don't remember all, all of what you said on, on the feedback was, uh, 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 that you'd got, it was largely had to be largely good because this, this is quite an attempt to lay this out and do a tactical, a tactical type, uh, educational game, but it, the, uh, that's one way that that's how I ultimately ended up, uh, uh, meeting Jim and, and, and working with him. I, I, let, I me, wanna, wait, let me, let me just get in here. Something sure. that, that, uh, that, that is less well known. I was dealing with the military. I had Terry Hardy and a couple other you know people at SPI were the main points of contact on these various projects. They were intent on, uh, how should I put it, uh, getting war gaining uh, into the army in a, in, a, in a large way. And one of the things they wanted was a, a game that uh, more troops could pay and I, play. And I pointed out that that isn't going to work. Uh, we had disagreements on that. They, they finally learned the hard way that I was right. Um, there were a lot of uh, professional, obviously professional military people in the military, but there were not a lot who were willing to sit down and learn rules and, you know, and basically, you know, play the game. That's only a small percentage of the population will do that. That's absolutely and, true. And, 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 and many of those games were distributed, uh, and, you know, in larger numbers to units uh, to see and to get a reaction. And that's the one thing they got back. And I said, well, there you go. Uh, but the point was still valid. What uh, Austin had found out that if you give the game to some of the war gamers in the unit, you know, guys who identify and are willing to sit down or into this sort of thing, you get a lot out now. Two other things I got I got into conflicts with. One was the influence of terrain. That was an issue before the game was even finished. Uh, we knew from experience, and indeed we got we got the accurate terrain maps of the area that we were supposed to represent in the in the game. And one thing I pointed out, I says, you know, you're not going to get a lot of long range shots. And later on, I found out the Germans had done the same thing, and they found out that the average. Uh, the average uh, range of engagement for that area was at most 500 meters. Uh, the Germans knew Germany. They had all these trees. They had all the shrubbery. They had all these built up areas. You know, even in a rural area, you have a lot of buildings. And they later discovered, or the Americans later discovered, a lot of these buildings are made out of concrete. It's a German thing. Who knows? But anyway, this has an adverse effect on the effect of this, or, or, or it can be into your advantage. If you, if you get your people into those concrete buildings before the Russians do, uh, you have an edge. In other words, you have, to, you have to take into account the terrain, the absence of long shots, and basically develop, ki and develop kill zones. So that all came out of that. The other thing that the Army fought us on was command and control. Now, we pointed out that you have to allow for uh, confusion, in the in the in the in the uh, and the in the issuance and the acceptance and the execution of orders. Now we knew this from historical games, even during World War II, even experienced American units. There was a certain level of confusion, fog of war, whatever you want to call it. And they they said well, one lieutenant colonel who was the point man, I forget his name, who was making these trips to New York rather frequently. Uh, he said, "All right, I, I talked to him about this, and he said the official attitude is." 
we don't have a command and control problems in the American Army. And I sort of, <laughs> I, eyes rolled and he sort of shook his head and says, yeah, all right. Uh, but Did after, he really, he, he really said that to you. Well, he, he, said that was, yeah, he said that was, that was what he was told. He was told. Okay. <laughs> he okay. was, he was ordered to, to deliver this to those, 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 those right. people <clears throat> up in New York. And, um, and uh, that eventually turned around. That was one of the things that Andy Marshall seized on. Because Andy Marshall, before war games, you know, commercial war games, he became uh, quickly familiar with those. Uh, before they became available uh, on a little wide scale to people in the military, again, just the people who could, who would do it, who were war gamers, who would, who were, who basically looked upon it as a, uh, as a, as a fun thing to do, as it were, entertaining, you know, worth their time. Uh, to sit down and learn rules and play out these games several times, et cetera, et cetera, trying different things every time. Uh, they came to the same conclusions. And Andy used this because in, I think it was in 77, they had the Leesburg Conference where they, for the first time, they assembled all the civilian people who were responsible for developing what passed for war games in the military at that point. And I was, I think, the sole outsider and my speech and Andy's speech, he came first, thank God. He said, you people have never given me anything I can use. Now, that, now he was speaking with authority because he was in the E-ring. He was in the inner circle as we were in the Pentagon. He was the head of net assessments. And it was up to him. His, his analyst basically had the final word on well, what is actually, what does, Russian, what does a Russian division or corps or whatever actually, you know, what can it actually do against various NATO contingents? And he, well, he saw we were, what we were doing was exactly what he was doing. He said all his stuff was classified, but he found out that the access to classified information didn't get in our way because we, we were the first ones to use OSINT, open source information on a wide scale, very effectively. And that impressed the hell out of him because I refused to get another, you know, security clearance or basically have people in SBI with security clearances working on this because that is more trouble than it's worth. I'm not going to get into that. But anyway, he recognized that they didn't need it because they basically wanted to develop product, as it's called now, that could be widely distributed to the troops, not a classified thing, which only went to a few, you know, people with a high enough clearance with a top secret clearance in the uh, in Division S3 or, or you know, G3 or, or G2 or whatever. J3. Oh, no, we're talking about you know, Division and, and, you know, even Brigade. But G3. You know, uh, units. Uh, S3. And, uh, so, you know, he was enthusiastic about somebody who could develop a game from open source, uh, open source material and prove it, which we could. Um, and that scared the crap out of a lot of people in the uh, in the in the uh, intelligence and, and security counterintelligence area. And it later came out, I think, in the 80s, somebody wrote a book. Uh, this is before the, the, the Soviet Union even collapsed, that the, uh, the United States was considered a plum assignment for KGB intelligence gathering or GRU. That's the military intelligence, military gathering things, because they knew something which was no secret in the United States. But back home in Moscow, they couldn't believe it, that there was so much secret information, information that would be top secret in Russia that was openly available. And they basically called these these uh, these assignments trunk assignments. In other words, all they had to do was fill up a trunk with the latest issues of uh, Aviation Week and space technology of Army mat per periodicals. The, the ones Austin, some of the Austin's material probably got shipped back to Moscow as valuable intelligence information. Um, <laughs> And when when this finally sank in, it scared the crap out of them because they realized that the American officers and, and NCOs and troops in general had access to more uh, valid planning data than their own troops. Uh, and a buddy of mine at the CIA, who later became, I think, number two or number three in the agency, uh, he he was he was he was one of the he was the head guy for the uh, the salt not the salt talks the, uh, the one of the disarmament talks involving uh, conventional forces whatever the acronym was, and he said the buffers <laughs> mutual balanced. Uh, yeah, right. Of forces. And, yeah. And I, I'm, I, I, I know I, somebody that gamed that, Jim. Yeah, so. and, I, and I saw him fairly frequently, and he said, you know, it was re really, and now he knew about all this, and he'd been working with SBI for years, and um, he said, you know, I was not entirely shocked when some of these Soviet uh, analysts, as it were, came over to us and asked, you know, could we have copies of your, your analysis 
Now, a lot of it was, some of it was classified, but a lot of it was like open source, like SPI level stuff. And he says, well, well why don't you, you, you have all this, he says, your stuff is much more accurate. <laughs> and he was talking about Russian, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, active uh, operations and, and in units and what have you. And of course, the most famous story that came out of Alan Ream, he, he was CI, he, in fact, he was the head of the NATO the vision, as it were, all NATO analysis. He re, he basically left the agency and went freelance, not freelance, but working for MITRE and various other organizations. There was much more money in it, and it was in way in a way it was much more less restrictive, as it were. But he he became he he knew the Russian war gamers, and when the when the uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, he was basically sent in. Well, actually, he was there in 91 when Yeltsin was standing up on top of the the, uh, the BMP, you know, giving his rousing speech, you know, to to, you know, suppress the, you know, the the, the anti-Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. His wife wouldn't let him go to to uh, to Red Square to see that in person. But anyway, he was close enough. He was he got in touch with his his opposite numbers in the uh, in the Stavka. These were basically civilians who were analysts and what have you. And the one guy was very famous, and he told a very telling anecdote. In the late 80s, 87, 88, he was tasked, uh, it actually was earlier than that, because he was he had just gotten his, the equivalent of a PhD. And uh, he was assigned to Snofka, and they said, all right, let's take the new guy. Uh, do an analysis of a, uh, of a, uh, a Soviet offensive against the, uh, the Western NATO forces, if we have to. And uh, he had, they had all the tools, their, their correlation of forces, et cetera, et cetera. He did it by the book and he presented it to them. He said, we'll lose. Well, they took one look at that. And, you know, faces were drained as it were blood. And uh, they took it away from him, so to speak. And they went into a top, top, top secret, you know, conference. And they came back. He says, this is classified much higher and you're being transferred to a science city in the Urals. These were cities which were set up just for scientists. It was, you know, they call them a golden bird cage. They had all sort of Western amenities, your canal car, nice Western style house and what have you. But you were completely cut off from the outside world. There was no internet. You know, your mail was censored and what have you. They appreciated what this guy did, but they said he's a he's basically a potential time bomb if he keeps on coming up with more stuff like this because the party line was that we would roll over them. But there was a certain way they could basically get the point to the and then at this point, the uh, several years later, uh, Biznev died, and then there was a succession of KGB officers, uh, senior officers who became the, you know, the head of the, the uh, state secretary as were the head of the communist party. And, um, they understood this stuff. And that's one reason why the Soviet Union came apart because, uh, when Brezhnev was in charge, so this basically occurred before Brezhnev died, if you want to, uh, most track down an exact timeline. Um, but after he died, now our friend was still stuck in the, in the golden, you know, science city. Um, and he was eventually able to go to the United States and make the grand tour and see all the things he'd heard about the military and and uh, a lot of CIA stuff, not the top secret stuff, but you know stuff that was unclassified or going to be unclassified. And it, notes were exchanged and ideas and what have you. It was, it was fun for all concerned. But the point was that it was truth that killed the Soviet Union. They realized, A, they were broke. That was becoming obvious, even though they didn't have a lot of accountants in their, in their inter, inner circle. They had to rely on, they had a few over, or, or, offshore, out, outside of Russia, banking operations to handle, you know, financing the, uh, the import, the growing number of, uh, of wheat imports, <laughs> wheat shipments they were getting, technology they could buy. Uh, but basically, the, the inner circle of the Soviet leadership were woefully uh, ignorant of finance, uh, much more so than any, you know, you know, American politicians of any era. And um, they, uh, but the, the, uh, the KGB uh, looked at what the analysis that had been done by these guys who were basically, you know, fresh out of the graduate school and just doing what they were told to do with the tools that were, that were recognized. Correlation of forces was simply taking historical information and applying it to, uh, to present day. But one thing that they were missing, and I later found this out, and this was a, this was a point of dispute within the Soviet army that when the World War II generation finally, you know, retired, were gone. 
by and large, and that was by the seventies when the you know uh, these guys these most of the uh, most of the Soviet officers, the ones who were the, 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 the heroes, as it were, except for the very senior guys uh, who were not much older. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they basically stayed in as long as they could, and you could stay in for a long time as a as a senior general, especially a World War II veteran. Uh, but they were mostly either dead, dying, or you know had to retire because of health issues, or simply getting too old for it. And they were basically overwhelmed by an upcoming generation who had no experience in war. And the the one complaint they were all making as they went out, he says, these new guys have no clue how we actually won the great patriotic war. They're believing all this propaganda we have created about how it was our destiny, that, 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 that. But it was basically a lot of basic techniques we learned, you know, at the cost of millions of Russian lives. Uh, and they had never enshrined these in the, uh, uh, in the Soviet doctrine. Uh, because they included things like flexibility, you know, change, learning. This was anathema to a government like the, you know, in the Soviet Union. Uh, you still see it going on in the few communist states we, we, you know, still existing, uh, North Korea, you know, Cuba. Uh, it's, it's, it's their fatal disease. China changed with the times, uh, but even in the military, well, that's another thing we cover in strategy page a lot. But anyway, the war games played a critical role in this area. The Chinese were getting our war games because we got visited by the FBI once, uh, wanted to go through our, our, our subscriber list. And of course they had their, they had the credentials. I said, no need to get a warrant guys. Uh, we're in enough trouble with some of the government agencies. Um, and what they were, our games apparently have been classified as munitions. I didn't know that. I found that out when the FBI came in and they were looking for people who were basically shipping our, buying our, our war games and shipping them over to China. Uh, which even though, you know, we had opened up the China, they were even then in the seventies, they said, oh, these guys are going to become dangerous and we didn't want them to get the war games. Well, eventually they got everything and they adopted a lot of the, the techniques we had developed because they realized this stuff works. The 90, 91 Gulf war made a huge impression on the Chinese because basically they saw the, the post Vietnam American military, which had gone through a lot of reforms. Uh, Ray Macedonia and I wrote a book called Getting It Right, which basically got down into the weeds, as it were, and gave details on how that all took place. Um, and the Chinese realized that uh, this was, we were going up against a, 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 a well-equipped Soviet-style army, and we rolled right over them. It was a 100-hour war, literally. It should have been, you know, another 20, at least 20 to 30 hours longer to destroy the Republican Guard, but that's another story. The But the thing was that it was... The, the, the engine driving the change was not a bunch of, you know, uh, senior officers sitting back saying, I think, I believe. They were officers who basically sat down and gained it out. And they said, well, I hate to admit it, but it looks like. And that's what the Americans had going for them. And a lot of the arms did that. Now, our NATO allies picked up on this. Uh, some Middle Eastern, the Israelis certainly did the big way. Uh, and um, they were very impressed by our work before the 73 war because we were developing a game on a potential 73 war. The Arab Israeli war was called. And it predicted that the uh, the Egyptians could get across the Suez Canal. Now, at the, at the time, the uh, Israelis were suffering from victory disease, which many Israelis pointed out. He says, you know, we're getting sloppy. We're getting too full of ourselves after the 67 uh, war. Um but they, they were a couple of war gamers from the uh, Soviet UN delegation, younger guys, who had come down just to war game. And as soon as the, the war started, they wanted to go back and join their units. But they said, no, 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 no. We know what you're doing down there on 23rd Street. Stay there. Learn what you can. Now, we had already been playing with these guys even before the fighting started, you know, pumping them for information. Now, they, they were reluctant. They did not give out any secrets you know, voluntarily, but we would say, now we're thinking of, of assuming that, you know, we, we had a general idea of how the, the Israelis had distributed their mobilization centers and what have you. And we would play, you know, well, you know, blink twice if it's this blink once if it's that, whatever. And so, and then we're doing this for their own benefit because one of these guys, we gave him, we offered him a copy of the play test copy and the rules, which he took back. And I'm sure that may have ended up back in Israel for all we know, or duplicated and ended up back in Israel. Um, 
but he knew the more accurate we could make the game, the more accurate, you know, they had a tool basically to help them figure out, you know, how the, how the Arabs, how the Egyptians had done it and what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. But it was all happening so much. But that made a big impression on them. A bunch of American civilians, you know, had figured all this out. And why the hell hadn't we? They haven't, well, they, they've actually made that mistake again in, in, to a lesser degree. And so they, they've learned to learn. They've learned that you, you, victory disease is something insidious. And you've got to constantly be testing yourself, double checking, gaming out, as it were, uh, what will work and what will not work. And this has paid big dividends. This is why they're, they're waltzing all over the Iranians, not just in Iran, uh, but in Syria. Uh, which has become a graveyard for, you know, uh, Syria, uh, Iranian uh, uh, IRGC and Quds Force, uh, you know, personnel, as well as all their mercenaries they're bringing in there. Um, and, of course, the Russians have become very on, as it were. They were never enemies of the Israelis. They basically stayed at, at the very least on, on good terms, uh, on polite terms with the Israelis. And they were one of the first countries to recognize Israel, you know, back in, in 48. Um and uh, they take advantage of this, and they, the last people they want to go to war with are the Israelis because they know better than anybody else in the area uh, that these are not people you want to fight. But again, the key factor in all of this is being able to get a consistent, a constant reality check. Reality check isn't something you do once and say, all right, check that off, what's next? It's something you've got to keep doing again and again and again and again. And the war games... One thing, anybody who's played them, and many of people who have, and I, since once email became uh, prolific in the, you know, in the last, oh, 10, 15 years ago, I started getting a lot of emails. I, and especially Al Nofi, they were the, we were, they were, we were the two people they would, a lot of these young kids at the time would see at the, what they call the Friday Night Follies, where we would play test the new games. And, um, these people became things like professional gamblers. Uh, they became analysts for the government. They became double pants. A couple became generals and what have you. But they all remembered, they took to, to heart the lessons they had learned with the need to constantly game out your options in an ever changing situation. One thing the Army did to their credit, and they're still at it, was they set up a thing called the Center for Army Lessons Learned. Now, I had a little input into that. Because I pointed out, they, they were asking me down at the war college, how do you know all the stuff about what we did during World War II? I said, well, one of the things I did when I was designing, uh, I think I did, a, uh, we did a, uh, we did six battle of bulge games at SVI, yeah, the first one. I went down to uh, Washington and they had a uh, World War II history branch, which was a bunch of civilians and this huge filing cabinets, you have the filing cabinets of World War II records. You know, basically operational records and what have you. And they had a lot. And in one, I got into one filing cabinet full of information on lessons learned. These were things which they, you know, tactics the Germans were using against us. They'd write up a one page, you know, handout, you know, a, a mimeograph, whatever, duplicate it and pass it out to every, you know, infantry company, uh, you know, in, the, in Europe and what have you. And it, God knows how many lives it saved. But. What I pointed out at the War College was, I says, are we saving this or are we letting it just slide away? And out of that, in I think it was Leavenworth, somebody picked up on that and they founded the Center for Army Lessons Learned, but they collected all this historical information and they realized that historical information is made fresh daily. So they collected all the information from the, not just Vietnam, they had the World War II information. And of course, they noted that a lot of the stuff is repeating itself. In other words, uh, a lot of the things are learned, relearned again and again. So they set up a program where in as far down as basic training, but also in advanced training and tactical and operational uh, you know, planning and what have you, they would constantly have the ability to refer back to, well, what did we do here? What did we do there? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they have kept this going, thank God. Uh, but it's yeah. a struggle because you're up against... I hate to say politicians, but you're up against bureaucrats, let's just say, because they're in the military, they're in the defense department, as well as, you know, in, in, in the executive branch. Uh, who basically have, from watching television or whatever, have developed their own idea of how things are in the world, which are out of sync with how they actually are. And as the as I learned with working with the SBI, the, the CIA, was uh, they developed a, a, a technique which was known to people in Congress and what have you in the executive branch, was when you ask for a report, the main text 
would be what you were basically told or, you know, suggested that we wanted to see. But if you wanted to see what was really going on, go to the footnotes. Because basically, when they wrote up these reports, the CIA analysts knew that, all right, this is a, this is a party line. You got to have this in your main text. But you put all the reality you want in the footnotes. And they had ex- Extent, extensive footnotes. Now, I didn't get to see a lot of these reports because a lot of them were classified. But as, as years went by, even even as I even as, as I was still in touch into the oh, I think the last time I was down with the uh, CIA was uh, nearly twenty years ago. Uh, but they were declassifying a lot of this stuff, and uh, and sure enough, uh, you look in the footnotes, and that's the reality check. And if you just want to amuse yourself and see what the you know the political attitude was at the time, just read the main text. Yeah. Amazing stuff. But that's the well, that's that's that's, that's probably a good place to to wrap this up for today. Uh, our reality check. Uh, we've run out of time. <laughs> and, hey, hey, but hey, Dan, I yep. want to insert something. Jim had a very receptive audience at the Army War College, chiefly by Colonel Ray Macedonia. But there were a lot of people there that I ultimately involved uh, that had influence in the reformation of the army uh, post Vietnam that were uh, in, very interested in these techniques. If we, when we do another one of these, I'm, I will talk about how we examined, uh, and I did this on one of my reserve tours uh, uh, at uh, the War College, the Russian Operational Maneuver Group, which was an attempt you know, to actually get some flexibility in the Soviet system. We right. gained that, and I'll give it away. They didn't have the logistics to support it. Now, that that's just a quote-unquote paper test, but those are ways to look at something, look at a, what a, a, an opponent, an enemy, is claims to be a threat that, that he's going to do to you, and you discover its weaknesses, uh, or potential weaknesses, something yep. you can take advantage of. The War College could see that out of SBI games, and Jim, I don't remember the. you, you told me once the first time that you uh, uh, liaisoned with uh, Ray Macedonia. I think he said 1978. I think Colonel Macedonia no, was, was, was mid-70s. I had a call from Colonel Macedonia. Uh, yeah, that's it. Pentagon. Yeah. He had been tasked uh, to reintroduce wargaming into the uh, Army and start out in War College. So he and I hit the war college about the same time. Yep. Yeah. So that that must have been 74, 75, because yeah. he was working on airland battle uh, for the uh, joint staff. But sem- maybe 78 was when he first had you at the war college or whatever. No, I, that, I didn't that, get that off on that, Dan. That's <laughs> okay. We, uh, so next yep. next time uh, as we sort of took a detour, and today ended up being the intersection of commercial wargaming and uh, – and military war gaming next week uh not next week but next time we do this we'll pick it up uh as jim exits the army and starts getting involved with commercial war gaming um and uh his well not his first game because i found out doing some research his first game was really deployment but yeah. his first published game uh we'll talk about jutland and how that came about so uh, we will talk to everybody next time, and until then, we'll see you. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye, guys.